This is a response to Solo's Girl 18's video, The Peppered Moth. I have to say that this is a new experience for me as you're the first creationist I've responded to who seems to have an open mind. So before I begin, I'll ask you to please consider one thing, and that's this. If I appear to be making fun of or insulting you in this response, then I hope you'll realize that my barbs aren't aimed at you, but at the factually incorrect points in your video and the dishonest toads who've been taking advantage of your naivety to feed you their poisonous lies. So with that said, let's take a look at where you're getting your information from. So, um, I was looking through my evidence bible. Once again, if you haven't seen my Mormon video, it's the evidence bible. Get it. Get this book. It is amazing. Especially for you science people. Okay? And if you have a lot of questions, and if you want a lot of logical evidence, this is the book to get. It is. It's amazing. Okay? I have to confess that I hadn't heard of this particular publication before, and so I went over to Amazon to take a look. That's when I realized that it was produced by none other than Ray Comfort and his <clears throat> special friend Kirk Cameron, and suddenly everything became clear. Since these two gentlemen happen to be a couple of the most notorious, dishonest, and disingenuous creationist apologists in existence, it's little wonder you've been misinformed. I don't have time to elaborate here, but I'd strongly recommend that you spend some time searching both YouTube and Google to get a better feel for the magnitude of their combined stupidity and dishonesty. In the meantime, I'll use this example of the peppered moth to give you a little taste of their mendacity. This is what um, they're talking about, the peppered moth. Um, and for those of you who don't know about the peppered moth, Basically, um, this is how, like, they proved evolution or whatever, because, um, like... Presumably Ray and Kirk's rag gave you the idea that the peppered moth is how they proved evolution. Now, wouldn't that be convenient for the creationist? If only the whole of evolutionary theory hung precariously on a single fraying thread, all that it would take would be one keen mind honed and sharpened in the prestigious halls of Liberty University to slice that thread and bring the whole godless edifice tumbling down. This is merely a setup for the classic Achilles heel fallacy where the creationist misinterprets the magnitude and concordance of the evidence that supports evolutionary theory and then claims that his fallacious and ineffective attack on one minuscule example will disprove everything. So to put you straight, the peppered moth is just one example of evolution at work. It has become so well known because it is so simple to understand, requiring no training in advanced areas such as paleontology, molecular biology, or population genetics, and so it's a perfect illustration for teaching school children. It is by no means the foundation on which the theory is built. Evolutionary theory is supported by over a quarter of a million scientific papers, 150 years of testing by tens of thousands of dedicated scientists, and countless millions of pieces of individual data. It is easily the strongest and soundest theory in modern science and the only people who reject it are those who are either unwilling to open their eyes and look at this evidence for themselves or those who have looked but refused to accept the inevitability of reality. For example, evolution is supported by its explanation of the nested hierarchy of life as revealed by morphological analysis. The uncanny convergence of morphological and DNA sequence cladograms of extant species, the sequential order of specimens in the fossil record, the appearance of transitional species in the fossil record at exactly the same times as predicted by DNA sequence analysis, the conserved patterns of endogenous retroviral sequences between related species, the similarities in embryological development of chordates, the existence of atavisms and vestigial organs and countless examples of apparently poor design in tissue such as the retina and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And these are just a few excerpts from a very, very long list. I would strongly urge that you spend some time at least watching some of the hundreds of videos on YouTube on these and many other subjects to get an idea of how vast the evidence in favor of evolution actually is. You'll find it eye-opening. Now let's get on to what your book has to say on the subject of the peppered moth. And then it says, the peppered moth story has been trumpeted since the 1950s as proof positive that evolution by natural selection is true. Yep, looks like that's where you got it from. 
Once again, the story of the peppered moth is just one stitch in the vast, intricate and beautiful tapestry that's woven by all of the evidence that supports evolutionary theory. However, this clearest case of purported Darwinian evolution by natural selection is not true. The nocturnal pepper moth does not rest on the trunks of trees during the day. In fact, despite over 40 years of intense field research, only two, two pepper moths have been seen naturally resting on tree trunks. It didn't take me long to track down the source of this particular piece of disinformation. It comes from a review by evolutionary biologist Jerry Coyne in the respected scientific journal Nature of a book on the evolution of insect pigments by Michael Mayeris and a subsequent inaccurate and sloppy newspaper article in The Telegraph. Coyne was echoing Sargent and colleagues in questioning whether various field experiments conducted by Bernard Kettlewell in the 1970s regarding the predation of light and dark moths really showed that birds were responsible or whether other mechanisms were at work. Hence the emphasis on the resting site of moths. In any case, Coyne was mistaken when he stated that only two moths had ever been found on trees, because in the very book he was reviewing, Mayeris himself states that he had personally found 47 such specimens. While this shows that scientists are human and do make mistakes, why is it that the creationists responsible for these lies didn't read the actual book in question to find this out, or even maybe this excellent peer-reviewed scientific review on the subject? Perhaps it was because they weren't interested in the truth, but rather in spreading their slander to impugn evolutionary theory because it contradicts their own primitive creation myths. So in the end, the things that were not in question were the facts that moth color did change with the onset of British industrialization and was reversed with the implementation of the Clean Air Act, that this color change was due to a redistribution of the allelic frequency of the dominant gene responsible for the dark color, and that the exact same phenomenon was observed in the United States. As such, the peppered moth is a perfect example of the fact that evolution occurs. The only thing being debated is the exact mechanism of how it was occurring in this specific instance. This, in fact, is a perfect example of a healthy and honest intellectual debate and of how science is willing to question existing knowledge, reassess the status quo and make changes in the light of new data. This is what allows it to continually improve and advance as each new development is incorporated into the body of knowledge while the unbending dogmatic mindset of the creationist is satisfied with explaining nothing by explaining everything with their god. So where did all the evolution te textbook pictures of pepper moths and different colored tree trunks come from? They were all staged. Um, the moths were glued, pinned, or placed onto tree trunks and their pictures taken. The scientists who used these pictures in their books to prove evolution all conveniently forgot to tell their readers this fact. While creationists may have nothing better to do with their time than sit in an ostentatious barn and mumble archaic incantations at the ceiling, scientists and wildlife photographers have more useful things to do with their time than sitting in a wood twiddling their thumbs and waiting for moths to settle onto branches. Such staging is standard practice for this reason and these illustrations are just that, illustrations to demonstrate points and not scientific documentation of natural phenomena. Creationists who feel that this should have been pointed out to the readers also presumably feel that Fox News should nightly remind their viewers that the turd on their TVs is not actually Glenn Beck but a two-dimensional representation on a grid of phosphors, plasmas or diodes on their screens. To suggest that these photos were in any way deceptive is to be either completely ignorant of the point, incredibly mentally challenged or brazenly deceptive. In Ray and Kirk's case, it may even be all three. If the best example of evolution is not true, how about all those other supposed examples? It makes you wonder, doesn't it? And Mark Varney, I believe is how you pronounce his name, is the person who said that. Aha, there it is! The Achilles heel fallacy. Creationists are nothing if not predictable. If even by some miracle these sneaky weasels were right, this would in no way discredit the remaining mountain of evidence upon which the theory of evolution is built. This is a simplistic and dirty little smear that any politician would be proud of, and if you fall for it, you're merely submitting yourself to being led by the nose by these filthy liars. I'm not sure exactly what I think about that, um, even though I'm all for creationism. I'm not exactly sure whether I believe that to be true or not true.
As I said at the beginning of this video, I admire the fact that you weren't willing to accept this stuff at face value and I hope that this has given you something to think about. But don't take my word for it either. Look for yourself. A world of knowledge is only a few keystrokes away and in this day and age there is no excuse to unquestioningly believe what anyone tells you. I also hope that this will make you think a little more carefully about whose opinion you place more stock in. Consider the scientific method and the scientists whose quest for nothing other than the truth about nature have bought you modern medicine and hygiene, air travel, telecommunications, skyscrapers, spaceflight and satellites, air conditioning and refrigeration, cars, computers and plentiful food to name just a few. And now bear in mind that it's the exact same scientific method and the same type of people who've discovered the true size of the cosmos, the actual age of the Earth and the fact that we and all other living things on this planet have evolved from simpler earlier life forms in a dazzling and intricate process known as evolution. Now compare this to the despicable dishonesty of professional creationists such as Ray Comfort, Ken Ham and Kent Hovind who deliberately lie time and time again about the discoveries of science and knowingly continue to do so after their inaccuracies have been pointed out to them, all to perpetuate a creation myth that they cannot let go of and that is no more patently the product of primitive human minds than those of the Egyptians, Greeks or Vikings. And also consider that these disingenuous Monty Banks make millions of dollars selling their filthy lies to those who don't know any better, and so have more than a vested interest in keeping the cash rolling in by perpetuating their puerile stories using their vile lies. If you do open your eyes and think for yourself, I think you'll find it much more exhilarating living in a world illuminated by the brilliant spotlight of the discoveries made by the minds of men and women and not the sputtering candle of their simplistic and primitive imaginations.